Um, and so for the percentage of homeowners who are feeling the pain and maybe have lost their job or they're just, you know, they self-employed and they're not getting the benefits that other people are getting, or, you know, they, they haven't been able to get the, maybe they made too much money, they don't qualify for any of the stimulus and they haven't been able to get the PPP loans or whatever. So there's definitely people affected, but the government came in and is offering help for them too with the forbearances. So we see here the share of mortgage loans and forbearance increases to 6.9%. So that's a big number, but it's also not a huge number. That means that there's a big number of people who are making their mortgage payments. So again, keep that in mind. And keep in mind that the government controls 61% of mortgages, so they really do have a bit of a say here. And when we look at risky mortgage, mortgages from the past, Look at that in 2000, like I said, 2002 to 2007, when I was a mortgage broker, look at those horrible and risky loans we were doing in the red there. They were commonplace. And then look at now, you could barely see the red line. That's because loans that have been given since then have been solid. They've been tough to get. The average interest rate was, I mean, the average um, FICO score was pretty high. Everybody knows, full disclosure, you had to show every possible financial document you have to prove that you could pay that mortgage back. So again, very different scenario here. We can't compare the housing market today to the housing market back then when we had such a large share of risky loans. Again, very, very important. Another thing, look at the home equity in the U.S. since then. So big, big home equity uh, that's been created because people bought low and prices went up. They locked in low payments. Many people didn't take the money out. They didn't refinance and do cash out. They just kept the low payments and uh, didn't want to go through another housing crisis. Another thing is we've had, I mean, you, you saw it, the housing has been in very short supply, at least on the affordable side for sure. Uh, we have, look at that, since 2008, 2007, uh, U.S. single-family housing starts have been really low, really low. Look at that. In 2020, as I'm going to show in future slides, even lower. So we've had this demand for housing, and it's been, there just hasn't been enough of it, and that's going to continue because builders are kind of pulling back right now. When you look at the housing starts by population growth, population growth adjusted, look at that. In the 60s, there would be 47,000 starts. In the 70s, 53. Look at it. And then 2010s, 21,000. I mean, just way, way down from normal. So we, we, again, just have been very low on supply and definitely in the affordable range because even those builders bringing on new supply, they're having a really nearly impossible time trying to bring in affordable housing. As builders at Real Wealth, we, we uh, syndicate a lot of single family subdivisions and we are focused on staying within the median, um, uh, median price point of the area because we know that's where the demand is. Fred, my partner, Fred Bates, he's used to building luxury homes and in our Reno development, part of it was luxury homes and they have not sold as quickly as the more affordable. So it's just, just the biggest need out there is for affordable housing, and it's very difficult to, to build. And all the while, we have U.S. population growth. Recession or not, that metric is rising. And another metric that's just really important to look at that other a lot of other countries don't have such a, such a growing youth population. Look at that, 86 million Gen Zers. Um, with the oldest just being in there, you know, around 20 and soon to be forming households. So, or if they are forming households, it's it's in college, right? So at least the, the older ones. And then look at the millennials, there's, you know, the 82 million millennials. These are the people who are starting their families. They have young children. The oldest of them are not that young anymore. They're They're almost 40. So, these are the people that would normally want their own home and, and you know, a place to raise their kids and 
and their dogs and their, you know, be near jobs and so forth. So with that, what we're seeing now, of course, we had massive shock to the system, right? Nobody knew what was going on in March. It was insanity. I was terrified. Ask anyone in the company. I was like, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to go. And normally I have some sort of sense of it, but I was really terrified myself. Right, right around there where uh, traffic, you know, people looking at properties went way down. That's when we as a company were meeting with, we brought all of our property managers together on Zoom calls. And we're like, what are you guys going to do to collect rents and what's happening? And together they came up with some really great plans to make sure that rents got paid. And they did. And I'll be going through that in some later slides. Um, so that was really the peak of the panic, I think was right around that mid-March time. Look at that, Zillow traffic back up. And maybe that's partly because people are thinking, you know, it'd be pretty nice to, to live in a house right now and these interest rates are low. And if I'm gonna have to be, if this is kind of the new normal where if there's some kind of sickness going around, I gotta stay at home, maybe I, I want a nice home. Also, a lot of people are realizing, wow, I could work from home. If I'm gonna be home this much, I'd kind of like to enjoy where I live and work if it's the same place, right? And I, I think a lot of companies will be realizing they can save a lot of money. They're going to need to save a lot of money. They might just decide they want more people working at home. Real Wealth, man, we've been we've been a remote company for at least five years. Rich and I have been remote as owners for 10 years. And we found that our team was even more productive in a work from home scenario. We've got some really great systems. Be happy to share with you sometime. One of them is EOS and a program called 90.io, which really just helps keep everybody in a project management system um, with quarterly goals all broken down and you meet weekly and it, it just really works, I think better than even when we had offices. So um, here we go. See again, uh, mid-March panic, traffic was down with builders, but then it started to rise again. Um, and then the rate of sales declining has, I mean, basically sales have gone up. Uh, you could see where it just dropped, panic, and then started to rebound. Now, you might wonder, are people looking for housing because they think they're going to get a great deal? Is that why they're looking or because they just want to buy a house, take care, take advantage of low interest rates? Well, look at that. The largest segment at least from uh, Myers research was that no, they're not even expecting lower prices. They're just looking. Um, and then some, uh, you know, some think 5%, some think 5 to 10%, and then some think more than that, but it's a smaller percentage. Well, what does that all mean? Again, maybe it just comes back to pent up demand. Look at the GDP, how it's just negative, 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 negative. I think this is a pretty amazing slide. Look at residential up. So that's impressive. It's it's the one bright light, <laughs> you know, in the GDP. And maybe that's why so much money is pouring into it. Look at that. Fed announces unlimited purchases of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. Unlimited. This is unprecedented. Unlimited. Uh, normally, I don't like the Federal Reserve dumping money into the economy, but <laughs> this is just an example of how much the U.S wants housing to be stable, that they would give unlimited liquidity, unlimited to keep lending going so that people can keep buying homes. That's that's amazing. And to keep um, mortgage, I'm sorry, rates low. I'm just going to go back to the last slide again to see that. Residential, 21%, everything else negative. Amazing, just amazing. And it has a lot to do with stimulus. So uh, unprecedented funding, again, for small businesses. And this is another, another very unique thing that um, in the past, you know, past stimuluses in 2008, it sure seemed like a lot of money just went to the banks. That's what I remember. It was like, man, why did the banks get all this money? And then, of course, the, the reason was, well, so they can lend it out. But then we found out, well, they're not. And then we found out, oh, they're just buying stocks. And, you know, it was just oh, frustrating. And that's why you had, you know, all the, the, the pushback. Well, this time, look at that money going to small businesses. Now, of course, it ran out almost immediately. So a second stimulus is out and 
hopefully more people can take advantage of it. And I think the reason, um, you know, this time that our government understood why this needs to happen is the United States small businesses employed 58.9 million people or 47% of private workforce. So a lot of times when we're looking at where should we buy real estate and we want to be buy big business, well, you also want to be by small business. You want to be near small businesses because they employ a lot of people. So it's unprecedented that these small businesses can get help and it's really cool and I hope more people are able to take advantage of it. Unfortunately, the first round, uh, it was very uneven in distribution. If you see there, California kind of came in last um, as far as <laughs> getting help, but maybe that's because there's so much of us or uh, maybe there's other reasons, I don't know, but um, hopefully the next round it will be spread out more. Um, but some of the markets that where we look at Ohio got 70%, that's pretty good. That's an area that we like investing in Indiana, Michigan. So that's good. Now the next stimulus, which seems like another kind of to the people kind of thing, is this uh, infrastructure package, you know, uh, President Trump. Now listen, every time I even mention his name, people either love me or they hate me. I am really not trying to be political here. I'm just, I just am pro real estate, right? So when I see things that are going to help real estate, I'm going to talk about it. And one of the things that I always talk about is you want to buy real estate where there's new infrastructure coming in. Always. That's how Rich and I got started is we bought houses in Texas near where a new freeway was going in Rockwall. And those those houses tripled, if not quadrupled in value. Unfortunately, we sold them before they <laughs> made all that money. But um, But many of our members at Real Wealth kept them and made lots and lots of money because of it. So, and it was because we bought near infrastructure and that's been our plan ever since is always find out where's the money going and buy real estate around it. So if this comes through, we really wanna pay attention to where that money is going and what's being built in America and how we can as real estate investors get, get uh, buy stuff near that. Um, of course, the next big question is, since real estate is so de dependent on people working, when will they get back to work? Obviously we can't have 30 million or 50 million or however many people it's going to be out of work forever. So what we do know is that uh, more than a third of the population live in states that are partially reopened or will be soon. So that's interesting. 13 states have already partially reopened and another seven have announced a date to do so in the next week or so. Well, and in all, 58, in all, 58 million Americans, or about 18% of the population, live in states that have already partially reopened. So it's starting. And it's, of course, uh, not across the board. It's, it's different in every state. So we need to be pay, uh, paying attention to the states that are reopening. Again, not all states are affected equally. This is on the, the job losses. Uh, we hear these horrible news about job losses, but it's not everywhere. If you look at that, Florida is an, as a market that we've been really bullish on for so many reasons, be, because you know state income taxes, it's affordable, there's massive demographic uh, movement towards Florida, and it's only, it's had some of the smallest share of job losses. Same with Texas, look at that, only, uh, you know, 9%. So that's, uh, you know, that's that's important for us to pay attention to that when we hear headline news, it's it's like saying, you know, America had a hot spell, you know, it, it, no, right now I'm in Malibu, it should be hot and it's overcast and cold. So you just never know. Every market is different. So we've really got to pay attention to what's happening in specific markets. And here's some news that you don't see much, and that's why I'm sharing it with you. I, I learn these things when we do our, our webinars highlighting what's going on in the different markets because I, you know, it's a lot to keep up with. So uh, in the mornings before our webinars, we we get on with the property, we get on a you know a Zoom call with the property managers to find out, you know, what's what's really going on. I'm tired of negative news. I want to know what's really going on. And then I get these kind of articles. Amid COVID-19 pandemic, nearly 481,000 jobs are available across Texas. Now listen, if you were never thinking of moving to Texas, 
but you're out of work, you might be thinking about moving there now. I mean, that's that's amazing. So this slide I thought was particularly interesting based on everything I just said. Uh, we know it's gonna be a tough Q2. Um, you know, we, we know Q1 was negative in, in, in terms of the economy and GDP. And we know uh, Q2 is gonna be even worse. There's been lots of estimates about how, how bad, and that's basically April through June, right? So we're halfway through and it's expected to be real bad. But what happens from July to September? Look at that. Goldman Sachs, Moody's, Bank of America, Myers Research. Now I'm gonna probably listen to Myers Research more because they are in the building world. They basically do research for home builders. So I care about what they say because we are home builders and we're in the, the home, single family home business whether it's rentals or selling retail. So I really like seeing what they have to say. Kind of interesting what the others say, but what what they're all unanimously saying is there looks like there's going to be some kind of boom starting around July. Now, why would that be? Would it be because of some of the things I said earlier? You know, that there's so much stimulus and, and that you know, states are starting to open up and we're starting to figure this thing out. There was so much panic, but now we're saying, well, maybe not everyone has to stay home. Maybe just certain people should stay home. And and if they do go back to work, maybe they can go back safely. Maybe there's a way to do that. Um, does it make sense for everyone to stay home? Um, and, you know, obviously not everyone's staying home. I mean, I've got, I had a plumbing issue and the plumber came out like within, I don't know, 15 minutes or something like that. So, um, so like people are still working for sure and they showed up in their masks and they fixed you know, our, the pipes. So, you know, people are definitely still working. So why couldn't more people work just safely? I went to the store the other day. I was so scared to go to the store. I was ordering everything from Amazon. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be brave. I'm going to go to the store. I put on a mask and I went to the store and they have, now they have like plastic things up in front of the register. So, well, that's brilliant. Hey, just, to, I don't know if it helps, but you know, there's, things that can be done so that pe people can get back to work. And apparently these companies think that's what's gonna happen. That's all I can figure, that they would all think that things are going to bounce back. Something is going to happen in July. What is it? Very positive. 